Let me go ahead and I just want to go ahead and review a couple of things from last week. Everybody got their notes from last week? Okay. So I just wanted to go ahead and discuss a couple of other concepts that you might run into. Uh, these are not blue light specials, and you guys remember what a blue light special is, right, from last week, so we're good there. Uh, and I know that you guys are discussing uh, terminology, medical terminology in uh, lab, I believe. They start out with a med term. And this is going to relate to a little bit of that and just some basic terms that you're going to run into when you talk about charting and orders and things like that. And uh, what does Q mean? If you see a Q... Every? Everybody's good with that. All right. So if you were to see something like Q and a little thing that looks like 24 degrees, what, is, what would that mean if you were to see that? Every 24 hours. Every 24 hours. There you go. Every 24 hours. All right. Now let's just talk about a couple of other things or a few other things you'll see. Uh, what if I were to see B, I, D written? Twice. Okay, yeah, so that's twice a day. And, of course, these are all based on uh, Latin terminology, uh, so that's why it looks so weird. Um, but B is just uh, by, just think of by or, or two. Okay, well, how about T, I, D? Three times. Three times a day, okay. And what about Q, I, D? Four times a day. Four times a day, all right. How about uh, Q, six? Six every six hours, okay. Uh, Q4, every four hours. four hours, all right. And what about PRN? As needed. As needed, there you go. And does anyone know what that literally means? No, it's pro re nada. So it's a Latin term for as needed. Only reason I knew that is because I was in, a, in the military and that was the name of our the, the nickname of our medical unit was Pro Reynata, as needed. Okay, everybody's good there. So that was just uh, some of the basic terminology that you're going to see on the charting. Uh, a couple of other things I want to talk about. Uh, when we talked about elimination of medications, you remember from the first lecture I'd mentioned something. Uh, what substance that I'd mentioned that we can eliminate in its unchanged form? Um, no lungs. You guys remember from last week? Yeah, we can actually eliminate it through alcohol. alcohol. There we are. Yeah, alcohol. The big medication that we run into in the hospital that, that can, can be, or actually is mo eliminated almost exclusively through the lungs, uh, the class of medications are known as inhaled anesthetic medications. Uh, these aren't medications that we will typically give but we will take care of a lot of patients that come out of the OR, the operating theater, uh, that have received some, some type of inhaled anesthetic medication. Uh, most of those are excreted. They're both absorbed and excreted uh, through the, the pulmonary system, and they're generally um, excreted in an unchanged, unchanged form, uh, so there isn't a whole lot of metabolism that occurs with your inhaled um, anesthetics, uh, nitrous oxide, um, Halothane, uh, all kinds of all those. We won't use them, but we will be taking care of patients that have had them. And you guys will be talking about some of the complications associated with anesthetic medications because there are actually a lot of complications. Um, have you guys heard of a word called atelectasis or atelectasis? You guys remember that? Uh, did they talk about that? What does that mean? Collapse. That means collapse of the alveoli. That's actually uh, very common. That occurs uh, during surgery. And it's associated with uh, anesthesia, inhaled anesthetics. Um, you can get some, some fairly significant atelectasis sometimes. And that's something we'll talk about how we, what we can do after somebody's come out of the OR. There's certain things like incentive spirometry and what have you that we can do to help, help patients out with that. Uh, you guys, have you started your cardiopulmonary anatomy and physiology in lecture? Unfortunately, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so what is uh, when I say the term when I say the term mucociliary escalator, what do I mean? <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's it's a it's a mechanism. It's it's actually several things. It, it involves the little cilia, little hairs that beat, and then it, it involves the the uh, lining of our airways, 
Is this a lower airway thing or more of an upper airway thing? Upper. More of a more of an upper airway thing. We don't have cilia in our alveoli, mm -hmm. um, but we do have cilia in our, our upper airway. So we have mucus secreting. We have like goblet cells, mucus secreting cells. We also have pseudostratified a columnar epithelial tissue that, that lines the airway. The goblet cells secrete mucus. We have a gel and a sole layer of the mucus. We have the outermost layer is kind of sticky and it attracts uh, particles, dust, uh, germs, things like that. And then the cilia beat very, very quickly and that pushes all that up. And is that a good mechanism to have? Yes. Yeah, we need that mechanism. We need that mechanism to clear stuff out of our airway. What do you think happens to people that have anesthesia? Stops it, yes. So they do have impaired mucus clearance. They're not able to clear mucus as well following surgery. And you guys are going to be talking about things that we can do to help these patients out in the lab. Uh, I'm not going to test you on um, most of the stuff that I talked about there. I just want to give you guys a heads up that um, about that class of medications just because we don't give them, but we do take care of patients that have had um, inhaled anesthetic medication. So. And we'll talk about them in a little more detail later on in the class. Uh, let's see here. Um, I also wanted to discuss another. Uh, did you guys read? Did you get a chance to read the chapter, chapter one? Okay. okay. And you remember something called a black, black box label? Remember something kind of something so similar to that, black box? What is that, a black box label or a black box warning? What, what do you think that is? Risk of medication. Okay, so what it is is this, it's a really high risk of something. Does it mean that you can't use that medication? Not necessarily, but it means that there's a very high risk for some sort of problem. Um, and there are a lot of medications. Thankfully, most of the medications we give are not black boxed, uh, but there are a couple and we'll talk about those in a little later on. There are a couple, uh, but if somebody is getting a medication with a black box warning, there's a very high risk of something, and it's generally something ominous or something very bad occurring. Do you guys um, remember what happened uh, over the past year or two with a certain class of antibiotics? They just recently got on to the black box warning. You guys see that on the news or remember that? Medications like Cipro and... Uh, Leviquin, or what we call fluoroquinolones, and they cause something really bad happen. They cause actually Achilles tendon rupture, or spontaneous rupture of tendons. And uh, those types of medications, Cipro, Leviquin, uh, things like that, have actually just recently been put on black box because they can cause spontaneous rupture of tendons. Uh, you guys know where the Achilles tendon is. That's a devastating injury. If your Achilles tendon ruptures, that is a devastating injury. It, uh, it's very extensive to repair, long time rehabbing. So it's a pretty devastating injury. It happens uh, with these patients that take these antibiotics. And we'll talk a little more about medications that we use that can have some of these warnings, mainly the antibiotics. Some of the antibiotics we can give are actually inhaled in the inhaled form. Uh, can have some, some pretty, pretty severe warnings with them. So if you guys are good, if, I, if you hear me using that terminology, you know kind of what I'm talking about there. All righty. So I think that's it for uh, the recap from last week. I do have some homework for you guys to take home. Nothing, nothing real bad, though. Don't worry. Nothing, nothing real horrible. Um, the question I want to ask you guys is uh, there are two homework assignments. You saw those on, the, on Blackboard. Um, did you guys want to start on the second one, or do you just want to wait until a uh, week after next when we start that one? You mean the one after the math? Yes, the yeah. one after the math. The yeah, the cards and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I actually have those all copied out for you guys, so you don't actually have to print them out. Uh, so the question is, you have to do over over a break. You have to do assignment one, and that is the math. Yeah. Now, the week following that, when we start, talk, start talking about bronchodilators, you'll have an assignment then. If you guys want to start working on both of them, I'm fine with that. If you'd rather wait, we can just wait 
until those until we hit those assignments. So mm -hmm. what do you whatever you guys want to do, I'm I'm pretty flexible there. I'd rather start. You rather start? Okay. Now the Bronco dilator assignment, however, will not be due until later on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna make them all both due at the same time. I'll go ahead and hand them out to you guys so you can get a kind of a head start on them if you want. And uh, we'll talk about that toward the end of class today. Okay, so did you guys do the reading for today? Yes? All right. You guys print out the PowerPoints? Yeah. All right. Do you think I'm going to use them? Yes. No, I'm not going to use the PowerPoints today. <laughs> Uh, who found this chapter kind of confusing reading through it? Nobody? Oh my gosh! I shouldn't be standing here because I, I, I found it. I found it kind of confusing. So I'm going to kind of just go through it, kind of step by step, bit by bit, and make sure we're, we're everybody's okay. When you take your exam, you're going to have several calculation questions, and you'll continue to have calculation questions. So. Um, like I said, uh, the first class, really the first four, five lectures are critically important uh, for pharmacology. And this, uh, unfortunately for some people, is one of them. But the math isn't too bad, so we'll kind of work through it. So let's just talk about how we measure things, first of all. What is the general system of measurement in the United States? Is it? Yeah, it's an imperial. It's what we call an imperial-based system. How many people like that system? Feet, inches. Okay, a couple. Yeah. Or we're one of what? One of two countries, two or three countries in the world that still mandates that we have to learn an imperial-based system. What is so wrong with an imperial system like ours? It's not exact. It is exact. It is exact. It doesn't relate to each other. There we go. We can't convert. Or we can, but we cannot convert intuitively. Um, I actually had to take a, uh, a, um, a math exam. I'm taking some math courses online. And um, I did uh, very well, and there were a couple of equations, and they're like, how can, you, how can you do so well on all this trigonometry and inverse functions? How can you do so well on that, Chris? And then miss these stupid questions on on conversions. <laughs> and what it was is uh, they were asking me to convert um, ounces to pounds. I don't know how many ounces are in a What, 12, 16, something like that? How many pounds are there in a ton? 2,000, 1,000, 1,000? No. You can see that uh, everybody here in the United States, we've been using this system for how, how, how many years? Some of us are in our third, fourth, fifth decade of life. And we've been using this all of our lives, and do we know it? Do we, can, we, can we intuitively convert? No, it's so hard to convert from ounces. How many ounces are there in a pound? I think there are 12, right? 12? 16? 16. 16. 16. <laughs> You're all looking now. <laughs> exactly. So you can see just how difficult it would be to learn pharmacology in such a system. And um, some of you guys that have been in, it, it been in health health healthcare, because I know there are a few people that are, are already in healthcare. And if you've been in healthcare for more than say 15 years, you remember a day where they were ordering certain medications in grains. You remember that grains? And you're like, oh, how many milligrams are there in a grain? I don't even know, like 63, something like that. So you can see just how difficult this is. So sometimes I get some moaning and groaning when I say, oh, the metric system. Everybody goes, oh, the metric system. But when you really think about it, is our system all that great? The imperial system, imperial-based systems? No, there's no common ground for converting. And in healthcare, we do a lot of conversions, a lot of conversions. So let's just talk about the metric system real quick. What's nice about the metric system? What do you guys think? What's nice about the metric system? How do we convert things in a, in a metric in a metric based system? What is it based on? What's that? Okay, it's based on ten. It's based on ten, and it's based on moving a decimal point. 
So if I have 1.0, for example, or let's make it 10. We'll make it 10 since we're basing everything on 10. Let's say I have 10. It can be 10 whatever you want. 10, 10 somethings, 10 kilometers, whatever you want. It can be 10 of something. And I want to increase this 10 by a power of 10. Well, what do I do? So I have a decimal point here, right? I have a visible decimal point. Well, what do I do if I want to increase this by a power of 10? I just move the decimal point over, and what do I get? I get 100. Let's say I want to decrease this by a power of 10. Okay, I move the decimal back. And that is really all we're doing with the metric system, is we're moving a decimal forward and we're moving decimal back. And it's all based on 10. You guys have all taken chemistry. Do you remember studying pH in chemistry? How do we measure pH? A okay, it's a negative logarithm. So we're using a logarithm. What is a logarithm? That's it. It's an exponent. That's all it is. It's and what base are we using in a logarithm? Ten. We can use any base. You can use any number you want, but most logarithms that we use will either use base ten or something called the natural log. If you're really into mathematics, or something called e or the natural log. We're not going to use that here, so don't worry. So, if I were to write something that, let's say, it's 10 to the third, well, what is that? If I were to convert that into a, a, an actual number that we, it's 10 times 10 times 10, or one with how many zeros? Three. Three. One thousand. You can see the little three there. So all I've done is I've moved my decimal point, boom, 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 and I have 1,000, 10 to the 3. Let's say that I have 10 to the minus 3. So 10 to the 3, if I have my number line here, and we'll say this is 0, and these are all positive numbers, and these are all negative numbers, if I have a positive exponent here, 10 to the 3, I'm moving which direction? I'm moving right, moving right this way. So maybe I have a thousand over here. If I have a negative exponent, what way am I moving? I'm moving to the left, or what we call negative numbers. So what would uh, negative three be? Okay, exactly. What I'm doing is my decimal point is moving back, and it would be zero point zero zero. One, and how many places should I have I moved my decimal? Three places over. One, two, three. All right. So let's give you guys a trick question. I think you guys are getting this whole exponent business. Let's say that I have 10 to the zero. Who thinks one? Who thinks zero? Who doesn't know? <laughs> okay. Yeah, anything to the power of zero is one. It's kind of a weird concept. But if we didn't have it this way, if we didn't go back to one and start at one, that little decimal point trick I showed you, it would fall, fall apart. It wouldn't work very well. So it's nice that anything to the zero power will always just be one. Okay, so you can see that this whole what we call scientific notation, my right things in scientific notation, and I'm using a power of tens, is, is that simply the metric system? So that's all we're doing with the metric system, is it's just scientific notation, and it's just moving a decimal point this way or that way. And if you guys got that, you're doing all right as far as conversions. We're not going to do anything more advanced than that. So. It'll be, yeah, it'll be, it'll be pretty intuitive. It'll be very intuitive. Okay, so I want to talk about some basic units of measurement. We do lots of measuring in healthcare. And I want to talk about the basic unit of measuring mass. Now, on the Earth, is there something I can use interchangeably with mass on the Earth, only on the planet Earth? Weight. 
only here though, only on this planet in this class. When we talk about <laughs> physics next semester, mass and weight, totally different things. Totally different things, but that's okay. We, 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 can, we can say they're the same thing right now, right here, right now. Because they, they are, uh, the units are going to be the same. So what is the basic unit of mass slash weight gram. for the metric system? Gram. The gram. Okay. The gram. All right. So here I have the gram. Everybody, can you guys in the back see all right? Okay, I'm not writing too small. Okay. So I have the gram. I can either go larger than a gram or smaller than a gram. Would you guys agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I can either go larger, and we'll just, I'll put larger here, and we can go smaller. All right. Larger, smaller. Okay. What's the next thing up from a gram, larger, in the metric system? But the next common thing that we deal with. Kilogram. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll go common. We'll go the real common units. So I have kg, kilogram. What is the next common thing that's smaller than a gram? A milligram. Okay. And is there something, a common unit that's even smaller than a milligram? A microgram. A microgram. Or mcg. Everybody's okay there? Microgram? All right. There was a way uh, that we abbreviated it with a little mu, the Greek alphabet, and it kind of looks like a U, kind of a strange U, mu G. We don't use that anymore. Jaco kind of put the kibosh to that and said no. Uh, in an ideal world, we would actually write everything out. You'd actually write micrograms, milligrams. Does that happen in real life? No. So I do want you guys to be familiar with the notation. Okay, so these are the basic units that we're going to use in this class. Probably not kilograms. We're not generally going to give kilograms on a drug to somebody. <laughs> so we're generally going to be dealing in grams, milligrams, and micrograms. And do you think that we're going to have to convert from this up to here and then from here down to this? Yes. Yes, we will. Okay. So let's say I have one here for my gram. So I have one gram of something. It could be anything right now. It can be a, of a medication, what have you. How many milligrams would I have if I have one gram? Everybody would agree? Do you, everyone agree that I'd have a thousand milligrams? This is going to be one of the fundamental conversions for the metric system. And you can even write this in a little box. 1,000 milligrams equals 1 gram. Everybody's okay? You guys following me so far? Everybody's all right? Okay. That is a fundamental conversion that we'll be using. Okay. So if I have 1 gram... And that's 1,000 milligrams. How many micrograms do you suppose that would be? 10 to the 9. Who's that? Well, let's make it easier. Let me get rid of that. And let's just say, now let's just look at milligram to microgram. Okay? We'll ignore that for a minute. Let's just say that I have 1 milligram. Say that I have 1 milligram. How many micrograms would I have if I have one milligram? A thousand. Anybody see a pattern here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So one milligram equals a thousand micrograms. You know what? Might as well just throw that in our little box of fundamental things to convert. One thousand micrograms equals one milligram. How many grams do you suppose equals kilograms? 1,000 grams equals 1 kilogram. So we're not really going to deal with this conversion too much. You may see a little bit of it on your homework. Okay. So these are the two fundamental things that we need to know for most, uh, almost all, virtually all of our medication calculations right here, those two numbers. And from those two numbers, 
we will be able to convert virtually any medication you guys are going to run across in pharmacology, and then some probably, as long as you understand these relationships here. Everybody's okay? And I'll give you guys a little test hint. Maybe I shouldn't, but I will. When you take tests, what should be the first thing you do? There you go. Are you allowed scratch paper for a test? Yes. Are you allowed to write whatever you want on that? Yes. Yes. What do you think I always did in school right before I took a test? Or even now when I take tests? I write. I have verbal diarrhea. And I throw everything I can think of out on that piece of scratch paper. Woohoo! I'm good to go. And can you use those now? Yeah. Pull them from your memory, right? You didn't have any help. You can use them. That's what I would recommend. Um, you guys could do as, as far as a study aid is when you take an exam, there are certain really important concepts, throw them out, write them on out. Nobody in this program is going to gonna have a problem with you guys doing that as long as you pull it out of your mind. So, and that's, that's what I do. I still do it to this day. kind of helps me out. And, of course, every class you're going to have different things probably that you're going to be pulling out of, out of your mind. The good thing about pharmacology is it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward what you're going to need. Okay. So we have our conversions for mass. What is the other dimension that we deal with in medicine, the other common one? We have mass. Volume. There we go. And somebody said length, and you're actually right, because what is volume? Volume is a length in the z direction, a length in the x direction, and a length in the y direction. When you have those three lengths, we have volume. So you're not actually um, that far off. So let's talk about volume. So it's just space. So a length would be, simply be a line, or what we call one dimension. Generally, we'll say that's an x. And if I have two dimensions, we have a y there, right? And that just becomes a plane, a flat surface. Like a, like a piece of paper. And then if I add one more dimension, and if you can imagine a line coming out, popping out of the board, shooting at you guys, I can't actually do that, but what I'll do is just draw kind of a dotted line there. What do we now have? We have volume. We have, see if I can draw this. We have volume, like that. An X, a Y, and a Z. And, uh, Generally, we'll call that a Z or a Z, and it comes together to create volume. And obviously, we have you know spheres and things like that. But. Okay, so what is the basic unit of volume? The liter. The liter. Everybody's okay with the liter? All right. How many liters are there in a gallon? This is another question. <laughs> there, uh, there are, I believe, 3.8 liters? 3.7879 liters? I don't know. Again, that's why I hate the imperial system. I think we should, that's just my personal bias, so I don't think we should teach that. We should teach everybody metric system. That's what I was wondering. Because <laughs> that's what we've always done. And you'll, unfortunately, you're going to hear that a lot. Um, and, and you've probably heard that a lot in your life already. Why, why do you do it this way? That's what we've always done. <laughs> Change can be a tough thing, but... Um, so the liter, okay, and you guys will have to forgive my spelling. I spell things a little differently. Uh, I use a lot of old English, and so in your homework, you're going to see a lot of like A-E's and things, um, and that's just because I, I spell a little, little differently in, in, in the way that um, I do that. So don't, it's just one of those, those things. Anybody, anybody from... Uh, uh, a European uh, country or Africa, or right? even Mexico, they kind of spell a lot like. Yeah, um, you'll be we'll probably a little more familiar with that. If there are any issues, just let me know, and I'll try to mm -hmm. correct that. So, okay, so we can either go higher or lower on our leader. Are we going to really go higher in pharmacology? Generally not. We're not going to be given thousands of liters of, of something <laughs> to somebody. So let's make it easy. Let's make it easy, and we'll just put a, a boundary condition here. Right. And anybody taking any physics? Anybody have any physics? Yeah. See, I'll let you give you a little hint. Does physics really explain anything? 
No, it doesn't really. Basically, what we do is we put bound in physics. We put boundary conditions on everything. We make things perfect, and we go, well, if this is a perfect world, it'd be like this. And then we look at the real world, and we go, eh, it's not quite like that. But the perfect world does help us understand the real world. So we're gonna think perfect world here, and we'll go, okay, we're not gonna do anything beyond leaders. And in most cases in healthcare. That's the case. We're not going to be giving hundreds of liters of something to somebody. Um, hopefully not. We might irrigate wounds with liters and liters of, of fluid, but uh, let's just say that this is as good, high as it gets. And in my class, in this pharmacology class, I'm not going to ask you to convert anything larger than liters. Generally, we're going to be going this way, small. Okay, so what is the next smaller thing down from a liter? The common thing, a milliliter, okay? And you'll see ml. And guess what? That's all we're going to deal with here in pharmacology. Liters and milliliters. So, good, good. These are manageable volumes. All right. So if I have one liter, how many milliliters do I have? 1,000 milliliters. 1,000 milliliters. So for our volume here, we only have one formula, or one, one conversion, fundamental conversion we have to really care about, and that is 1,000 milliliters equals one liter. Everybody's okay with that? Okay. Now, I understand if you are exceptionally good at math, most of this pharmacology business you can do right in your head. And this stuff may not be all that helpful for you. If you are... If you do not find calculating as intuitive, this stuff will be very helpful for you. Uh, so don't, uh, don't feel, if you're really good at math, don't feel obligated to have to do it the way I'm going to show you. Uh, because if you're very good at math, you'll probably find it very intuitive just to do it in your head. And that's okay. I'm not going to ask you to show your work on a test. Now, I will ask you to show your work on the homework, however you do it just so I'm, I'm sure your reasoning is okay, but when you take a test, the bottom line is, you, can you calculate, can you do the conversion or can't you? Um, so I'm not going to ask you, write out all your work on the test. No. Do you get it? Do you, do, you, do you not get it? Okay. So these are the two fundamental units, mass and volume, and that's really all we're going to be dealing with in pharmacology, is I'm going to have a mass, I'm going to have something dissolved in a volume. And these are the fundamental relationships that we're going to be dealing with here. Is everybody okay? Everybody's okay on, on that? And again, if, if, you, if you think this is easy, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence. I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Because math is something that I really struggled at when I first went to college. Really struggled. I ended up having to take a year of developmental courses just to get into regular um, math courses. Uh, so if any of you are like me or were like me, um, I want to make sure that I don't lose you guys right now. So we'll just take it slow. We've got plenty of time to get through this, this calculation business. Okay, do you guys need to take a break? No, yes? <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. I'll keep going till about uh, 9 o'clock. I'll keep going about, about 9, and then we'll go ahead and take a break at 9 and, and finish it up. Okie dokie. So, we've got our units, and I'll try to just leave these up here. Let's just do some basic conversions between units now. Let's say that I have 500 milligrams. And I want to know how many grams that is. I know some of you are like, oh, that's easy, Chris. I can do that in my head. Some of us, myself included, can't do that in our heads as easily. And I want to show you a fundamental equation that you can use that will help and it's actually something that you're going to run into in other classes when you talk about um, certain oxygen calculations and what have you. In lecture and lab, this equation will come in very handy. 
those of you that have taken drug cal dosage calculations or those of you that were really good at stoichiometry and chemistry, you'll remember the term dimensional analysis. Any of you remember that term, dimensional analysis, or, per, or, or a proportion, setting up a proportion? That's what we're going to do. So how can I figure this question out if I don't know it intuitively? Well, I go back to, this is kind of like mom here. This is mom over here. And whenever I get lost, I don't know about you guys, but I run home to mom. And this is mom here. I'm going to run home. And this is mom. This is going to help me get through this stuff here. So I go, well, milligrams and grams. Mm -mm -mm. Ha ha. I have milligrams and grams here. So I'm going to set up a little equation. And I'm going to set up two sides to that equation. I'm going to have a left side here and a right side here. Everybody's following me so far? And on the left side, I'm going to put in what I know to be a fact, for sure. What I know. And what do I know for a fact? I know, when I'm looking at milligrams to grams, I know that there are 1,000 milligrams and 1 gram. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put 1,000 milligrams over 1 gram. Everybody's okay? Do you, you see where I did, how I did that? I know this for sure. 1,000 milligrams is 1 gram. And then I'm going to go to the right-hand side, and I'm going to put what I don't know and what don't I know. What this is. Now, when we set up this equation, I need to have the same units on top and the same units on bottom. So if I put my 1,000 milligrams to 1 gram, I need to have milligrams and grams. Does that make sense? Everybody's okay? All right. So I know 500 milligrams to question mark. And generally what we do by convention is just put an X, grams. Does everybody see how I set this formula up? Okay. Now, all I have to do to solve this is cross multiply. So this gets multiplied by this. This gets multiplied by that. Everybody's okay? So 1,000 times x, or 1,000x, equals, well, what's 1 times 500? 500. Okay. How do I get x by itself? Divide by 1,000 here. x falls out. This side gets divided by 1,000, right? Make this easy. I can knock out some zeros here. Boom, boom, OK. 10 goes into 5 how many times? That's 1 and 0, so 10 goes into 5 how many? What's that? Do you see what I did here? I knocked out zeros, and I have a 10 left over, and I have a 5. Everyone see that? That's just to make simplify it. So 10 goes into 5. I add a point there, and then I can add a 0 down here, right? 10 goes into 50 how many times? 5. 0 0.5 what? Grams. Because that's what we were trying to ask. Is 500 milligrams equals how many grams? 0.5. Now, that's a long way of doing it, but it is a way that always works. And if you can't intuitively do the math in your head, I suggest that you use a dimensional analysis um, to work through it, to figure out how things work. In some of your math classes, did they let you guys use calculators? Yes. For uh, calculations? Okay. This class is going to be a little different. You won't be able to use calculators. And the reason being is you won't be able to use calculators when you take the boards, um, which I hated. I hated when they told me that, because I actually ha got to use a calculator when I took the nursing boards uh, years ago. I don't know how it is now. But for respiratory, we can't use calculators on the boards. So I want to get you guys in the habit of kind of doing these calculations by hand. OK. What I want to do is I just want to do several examples. And we'll work through this so we can kind of get a feel for this. I also have some videos up um, under the Applied Mathematics playlist on my site. Uh, you can look at those videos as well for some more examples of conversions. 
I tried to click on that yesterday and I couldn't get anywhere. Did anyone else? On YouTube? A blackboard? Yeah. Or is it on YouTube? Yeah, it's on YouTube, the, oh, okay. the site, the, the one I showed you guys the first day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll show you at the end of class again. That way. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a volume conversion. Let's say that I have 300 milliliters. How many liters does that equal? X liters. Milligrams. How's that? That look a little better? <laughs> All right. So, I know that 1,000 milliliters equals how many liters? One liter, right? Mm -hmm. Front hold the bomb if we don't know here. One liter. And I want to find out this here. 300 milliliters equals X. How do I solve this? Cross multiply. 1 times 300 is 300. 1,000 times x, 300 equals 1,000 x. Okay, everybody's following me there? Okay. I divide both sides by 1,000. What I do to one side, I do to the other. That all cancels out. x falls down. And x equals 300 over 1,000, right? And what I can do to simplify this is I can knock out zeros. So I have a zero here and a zero here. Everybody can see that. I'll cross those out. I have a zero here, a zero here. I can cross those out. I don't have any more zeros, so I can't cross anything else out. So that gives me 3 over 10. Does that make a little more sense how I did that? So 10 goes into 3. Well, it doesn't really. So I have to put a point here. A decimal and then that allows me to add a zero 10 goes into 30 how many times 20 30 0 0.3 so 300 milliliters equals 0 0.3 liters okay did that one that everybody's okay all right let's do couple more here. 1,250 micrograms equals X milligrams. Okay? So something that we haven't done before. So what am I talking about now? Let's run home to mom. Mom says here. 1,000 micrograms equals 1 milligram. And you guys can see, because I'm doing micrograms to milligrams here, so this is the conversion factor that I'll use here. Micrograms and milligrams. My units need to match. Okay, so I know for a fact, over here on the left, that 1,000 micrograms equals how many milligrams? 1 milligram. Everybody's okay there. 1 milligram. And I want to know this, 1,250 micrograms equals X. I don't know. Everybody's following me there? Okay. How do I solve? Cross multiply. So uh, 1,000 X equals 1,250 times 1 is just 1,250. You guys good there. All right, so what do I do? Divide by 1,000 over here. That cancels out. Divide by 1,000 here. Can I knock out a zero? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Knock out a zero there. That gives me 125 over 100. Would you guys agree? So what would that be? So 100 goes into 125 at least once, right? So there's at least a milligram. I know that. And what about this 2.5 here? How many times does that go into 100? How many times? Four times? 25, 50, 75, 100? Am I confusing you? No, I'm sorry. So 
we have at least one milligram, would you guys agree? Or one, uh, yeah, one milligram, would you guys agree? It goes in at least one time. So I can put a one here, okay, 100. Can you guys see down that low? Okay. And that leaves me with what left over? 25. 25. Can I add a zero to this 25? What, what do I have to do to add a zero? Put a, put a point, one point, drop a zero down. 100 goes into 250. Twice. Two. I'm left with 50. Okay. Can I bring another zero down? Because I still have my, my point still there, so I can bring another zero down. 100 goes into 500 how many times? Five. Five. And that's 1.25 milligrams. milligrams. So, 1250 equals 1.25. Now, those of you that have an intuitive feel for the metric system, is there an easier way of doing this? Yes. yes. Just move my decimal point, right? Yeah. That's all it is, moving my decimal point. Do we point. have to show our work on that if you do it from here like that? No. Okay. No. On the homework. No, not um, just that. Show me, how, show me how you do it. If you oh, do it by okay. moving the decimal point, just draw a little way. picture where you move oh, the decimal okay. point. Mm -hmm. If you choose to do it this way, go ahead and show me it that way. Whatever, and if you have another way of doing it, by all means, do it. Um, just show me that you know the process involved in, in, in doing it. That's all. Um, it can be this way. It can be moving your decimal point. However, is most intuitive mo and e e perhaps more convenient for you guys. Um, I am showing you this because there are some people uh, myself included, that have a difficult time visualizing things moving. Um, so sometimes this helps out a little bit. Or if you want to use a combination, go right ahead. I don't see very much of that. All right. So do you guys feel pretty comfortable with converting units? I, I know it's probably something we've all done already. And you'll have a few examples on your homework. So nothing real big there. All right. Unit conversion, we're good there. Volume conversion, let's say that I have uh, 250 milliliters. How many liters does that equal? How would I do with the decimal point? Go this way, and it would be 0 0.25 liters. Everybody's OK there, because I'm just moving my decimal point that way. If I didn't know that, I could set up how would my formula would look. 1,000 milliliters equals 1 liter. 250 milliliters equals x. And that's how I'd set cross multiply, solve, and I'd still come up with 0 0.25. All right. All right. So now we're going to get into pharmacology, the application of pharmacology, and we're going to combine these two things. And what, what we usually have is we have a volume. I'll draw a little box here. It's not a very good box. We have a volume. Let's just say that this is a centimeter, a centimeter, and a centimeter. Okay. The length, and that would be a cubic centimeter, or what we call a cc. <laughs> what do we call it in healthcare, though? A milliliter, yes. That is the common. Milliliters equals cc's, though. So let's just say that I have one milliliter of volume here. So I have one milliliter of volume. And in that milliliter, I dissolve a medication. Let's just say, we'll arbitrarily say that there is one milligram dissolved in here. One milligram of particles, if you want to look at them like that. So one milligram of a drug dissolved in one milliliter. That's what we're going to be dealing with in pharmacology. And the common convention that you'll see is one milligram per, little slash there, milliliter one milligram per milliliter. You may see 500 milligrams per milliliters. 
Everybody's okay there. You may see 123 milligrams per milliliter. Can we have micrograms per milliliter? Sure. Yeah. We could have 100 micrograms per milliliter. And may you be asked to give half a milligram of this. So let's see if we can do that. So a common problem that you're going to run into is something like this. I have 100 micrograms of drug X, whatever kind of drug. It doesn't matter at this point because we're just doing the calculation. 100 micrograms per one milliliter, per milliliter. And I, that's what I have. I have a little vial of medication here. Okay, and in that vial, there's one milliliter. Okay, everybody's okay there? There's one milliliter in there, and dissolved in that, I have 100 micrograms. And I have as many vials as I need. Everybody's okay there? And I have an order for 0 0.5 milligrams. I need to give 0 0.5 milligrams of this medication here. So, I need to know how many milliliters of this to give. Everybody's tracking me so far? So, how many milliliters do I give? How many milliliters of this? So, basically what it's asking is how many milliliters of this equals 0 0.5 milligrams? Some of you can do this in your head. Some of you maybe not. Let's just go ahead and design a formula to solve this. So, I'm just going to put a little bit of base. So I have 100 micrograms mcg per milliliter there. And I want to give 0 0.5 milligrams. Okay. So, what do I know? And this is going to be a little different for the setup. A little different for the setup. I know that I have 100 micrograms per milliliter, right? If I set the formula up the way that I showed you for simple conversions, will it work very well? No. Why? What's going on here? What's that? The formulas aren't fitting. Right, the formulas aren't fitting because I need to do a basic conversion first. I need to find out a couple of things, an either-or kind of thing. I either need to find out how many micrograms this is here or how many milligrams this is. Either way will work. Let's go ahead and look at milligrams first. 0 0.5 milligrams equals how many micrograms? 500. How many mcg? What do you guys think? 500. How about you guys in the back? What do you guys think? 500. 500? Everybody, everybody agree? So 0 0.5 milligrams equals 500 Micrograms. So really what this question is asking is, how many, mi how many milliliters of this is going to equal 500 micrograms? Have I now made this problem a lot easier to deal with by just doing one conversion? So now, when I set my formula up, if I choose to do the formula, I can do what? Well, I have 100 micrograms per milliliter, right? This is what I know to be true here, right here. And how much do I want to give? Well, I know 0 0.5 milligrams equals 500 micrograms. Everyone would agree? 500 micrograms per X. I don't know how many milliliters I want to give. Or I don't know how much that will be. Cross multiply. 100x equals 500. OK? 
Okay, divide both sides by 100. I can knock out some zeros, and I'm left with 5. 5 what? 5 milliliters. 5 milliliters. So going back to the original problem, where I had a little vial, and I had 100 micrograms in that 1 milliliter of solution, what this tells me is I need to get 5 milliliters of this to equal 500 micrograms or 0 0.5 milligrams. That's all. So when we actually do drug calculations, we're generally going to have to do a conversion. We need to make sure that all the units are the same. I can't have lopsided units when I'm doing my conversions. Let's do one more, and we'll take a little 10-minute break. And then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Okay, so let's do another question if we can. And let's see here. I want to give... Let's say that I have 500 milligrams per milliliter. So, or you know what? Let's do two milliliters. 500 milligrams and two milliliters. So I have a little vial here, and I have two milliliters. And if this helps you guys on a test to draw like this, some of you may help. Go ahead and draw on your test. That's all right. Go ahead and draw. You can have scratch paper. You can draw pictures if that helps. Two milliliters of solution. And within that two milliliters, I have this much. 500 milligrams dissolved in there. Everybody's okay with that? And I have an order that says um, I want to give 112 milligrams. Okay? So I need to give 112 milligrams of this to my patient. Am I dealing with the same units here? Sure. Sure I am. So what do I know? What do I know for a fact? 500 milligrams, 2 milliliters. Can I simplify that a little bit? Yeah. What could I do to simplify that? There we go. And that would give me... 250 per milliliter. All right. Work smarter, not harder, right? So I know if I have 500 in two, I'm going to have 250 in one. Everybody's okay there? Okay. So 250 milligrams per one milliliter. Don't make the math a little easier. And how much do I want to give? Well, I want to give 112 milligrams but I don't know how many milliliters of fluid to pull out of this vial to give my patient. 112 milligrams X. Okay, so cross multiply. 250X equals 112. Do you guys agree? All right, 250, 250. We don't have any zeros we can knock out there, do we? All right, so. 250 goes into 112. Well, it doesn't. So what do I do? Put a point there. And what does that allow me to do? Add a zero. Add a zero. So now I have 1,120. 250 goes into that how many times? <laughs> well, what's 250 times 4? 250. 500, 750, 1,000. So it goes in at least four times. Would you guys agree? Mm -hmm. So how about I put a four here, and then I'll put 1,000 here, right? Because 250 times four equals 1,000. Would you guys agree? What do I have left over? 120. Can I add a zero to that? Yes. Sure. 1,200. 250 goes into 1,200 how many times? Four times. And that is 1,000. 200, can I drop a zero? 
250 goes into 2,000? Eight, eight times. Zero point four four eight what? Eight. Four four eight. Do you think we have a syringe that can get that exact? No. 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 We can't. We don't. So, you think I'm going to ask you on an exam? to the, let's see, ten, uh, tens, hundreds, thousands, to the nearest thousandth of a milliliter, no. So are we okay to round that? Yeah. yeah. And generally two, what we call two significant digits, will be just fine. How about we just round that to 0 0.4, you guys good with that? 0 0.45, that's still going to be pushing it for accuracy. You may even fudge a little bit and go to 0 0.5. You're not going to have anything this accurate on the test, so don't worry. But we could if we had to. All right. How about we take a 10-minute break, guys, and uh, we'll come back and talk about a few more concepts.